my curiosity got the best of me. What can I say? <laughs> Even though I thought Saltburn was not going to be my movie, you guys probably could have called that as well. Just given the content, you're probably a little bit confused, as am I. I watched it and I was like, why is this so good? I hate to say it. Actually, I don't hate to say it. It does benefit you to go outside your comfort zone sometimes. <laughs> as much as I resist it, and I am fully self-aware that I resist it all the time because I love what's comfy, hence why I rewatch a lot of things instead of watching a ton of new stuff. It, it's fun to go outside of it sometimes because you find new things like Saltburn. And for me, it really inspired me for 2024 and that's become my theme of the year. I'm not really doing resolutions, but like my theme and my word of the year is like open-mindedness and also new, new things, new everything, reading new books I've never read before, watching new shows, new movies, new. I just need to discover new. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so grateful to Scentbird for sponsoring today's video because I am also branching out in my fragrances, like finding a new fragrance that is completely outside of my comfort zone, and I think I've done it. Scentford is the perfect way to experiment trying to find a new scent, especially we're in a new year. Find a new scent, try something new, you know? And it's the best way without like fully committing to buying a full-size perfume because those can run you hundreds of dollars. And these are not sample sizes either. Like these aren't the little itty bitty things that you get at the store or whatever. This is a full 30 day supply that will last you so long. This one I've been using regularly and it's I barely made a dent I'm the kind of person that sprays like one spray I don't overdo it with my perfume so maybe that's why I love that they have a ton of unisex scents and they're also the perfect size for traveling or on the go I usually have one of these little vials in all of my bags and since I'm trying to step outside my comfort zone I decided to try out some new scents so I'll tell you about a couple of them for I'm gonna start with my favorite because this is a new discovery this is a beautiful scent that I I'm so excited about. I've actually been getting way more into perfumes lately or fragrances um, because I landed on fragrance TikTok and I've been learning new things. The first one is by Commodity. It's called Milk. This has notes of skin musk, cashmere woods, amber, white cedar. There's it's such a beautiful scent, let me tell you. So the next one is from a brand that I've been wanting to try for so long. It's from Juliet Has a Gun, and this is the scent Moscow Mule. This has notes of lime essence, ginger, and broxen. This one is like fruitier. It's a lot sweeter and less musky than the commodity one, of course. I just love using the opportunity of working with Scentbird to like discover new scents. So try these out. I highly recommend these ones if you're going to try out Scentbird. So make sure you click the link down below to visit Semperd's website or you can scan the QR code and use my code POSSESSED55 for 55% off your first month. That's about $8 for your first month. It's such a good deal. Okay, although I'm primarily a horror channel, occasionally when I feel really passionately about a movie, I like to branch out and make a video on a movie. So I think a little bit ago, I made a video on Moonfall because I hated that movie so much. You could check out that video up here. Obviously nothing horror related there. And I really have to credit Amanda from Mandy's Morgue of Horror here on YouTube because I follow her on Twitter and she tweeted this tweet. Why didn't anyone tell me there was an MGMT montage in Saltburn that includes the fam watching The Ring? This is the sole reason I watched Saltburn. I'm not even, I'm not even kidding. I was curious. I was on Saltburn TikTok for some reason. Well, I can't even say for some reason because it was everywhere. Everyone was talking about this movie. What I saw from it was people saying how shocking it was and disturbing and disgusting. And so I was like, it really doesn't sound like my kind of movie. And then I saw that tweet from Amanda and I was like, you know what? I want to see what everything is about, you know? So once I watched it, I could not stop thinking about it. I was obsessed and I think I was in denial about it, but the soundtrack would not leave my head. Murder on the Dance Floor was in my head for a week straight until I had to watch the movie again. And I did. I watched it a second time because I was so obsessed with it and I needed to witness that again. And it was really good because I got to catch all the little things that I missed the first time I watched it. So surprise, I am not a prude after all. I genuinely love this movie, every aspect of it, even those scenes. I loved it. And I'm gonna say that Saltburn was the best movie of 2023, period. End of story. I even bought merch for it. 
Studio House Designs, my favorite horror merch company, came out with Saltburn merch. I bought it. So Saltburn follows Oxford student Oliver, who becomes obsessed with elite student Felix, who invites him to his wealthy family's estate for the summer. The cast is incredible. We have Jacob Elordi, Barry Keoghan. Now this is written and directed by Emerald Fennell, who also did Promising Young Woman. I haven't seen that, but I am intrigued. But I've also seen, you know, the differences. I've heard people say the promising young woman isn't as good so I don't know if I'd like it as much to be honest um, but she also starred as Midge the pregnant Barbie in the Barbie movie so and Margot Robbie was also a producer on Saltburn so there's a little bit of crossover there with Barbie so I will be doing spoilers in this video because I have so much to say about this movie but let's just address the elephant in the room of the disturbing scenes the bathtub scene the grave scene the vampire scene okay there is there are some scenes that are shocking in this movie but like I said I think they were so well suited in this story story that had they not been there, I don't think we would have been able to grasp uh, Oliver's mindset and I just think it was the perfect characterization of Oliver. And I'll get to specifics and I'll even explain the scenes as best I can in spoilers in case you're really curious, um, but you can check out, you know, parental guidance on IMDb or something, I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna try to stay monetized too, so it's not gonna be that you know, explicit. So this movie is heavily inspired by a book called Bride's Head Revisited by Evelyn Wow? Wow? I don't know. And now I kind of want to read it, even though it's a genre that is not really something I'm usually interested in. But in the spirit of 2024 being all about new stuff and going out of my comfort zone, I do want to read new genres as well. So I might pick it up. Also, I've seen people compare this. Uh, well, one of the criticisms I see a lot about Saltburn is that it's very derivative of a lot of other movies. And I totally understand the criticism about this movie in that it's derivative, um, just knowing the plot of some of these other movies that it's uh, very similar to. So a lot of people compare this movie to Cruel Intentions and the talented Mr. Ripley. I'm going to be watching both immediately. So I'm gonna get into specifics as to why I believe this is a perfect movie. Now, I, I wanna be completely transparent that when I first watched this movie, I gave it four stars because of the ending and how I feel like it kind of lost itself a little bit and over explained some things and just some like missed moments I think and like missed stories storylines that like really needed to be thought out a little bit more so I did initially rate it four stars I watched it again rated it five stars it's a five star movie it's perfect I okay I feel like saying it's perfect is dramatic but there's something about this movie so for me it's it's I want to say it's a perfect movie, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have criticisms to it. I know that doesn't make sense logistically with like how ratings work and w whatnot, but in my head it does. I don't know. So obviously, as I mentioned, it's set in 2006, 2007. It's not exactly my era of the early 2000s, but I'll take it. Like it's still mid 2000s, which I still love. Um, I have seen some criticism that some of the soundtrack actually came out after this movie would have taken place. So some musical references or even fashion references aren't accurate to the era. To me, that's very minor and it's like close enough where if you heard, I mean, if you hear the song in the movie, like Low by Flo Rider, for instance, you hear it in the movie, it doesn't, I don't know, I don't feel like it takes you out of it. Like that's not era appropriate because it came out a year in 2008 or something, you know? Like if you grew up within that era, as I did, I was in high school when this took place, I feel like it still works and you like get what they're going for. I literally saw saw someone say that this movie isn't accurate as a period piece because someone did a French tuck and French tuck is where you just tuck in like the whole front of the shirt instead of just like the little little center of the shirt that didn't come to be until later so therefore it's not an accurate period piece can we even call it a period piece are we calling this a period I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, some more things, references. References to Harry Potter. They're reading the latest Harry Potter book in this movie. Amazing. I mean, it's minor, but you know, you throw it in there, I'm gonna like it. Uh, obviously, the family watches The Ring in this movie. Love that, love the little shout out to The Ring. Like it's even in the subtleties of this movie. Like a lot of the songs that were in this movie, I grew up with. So everything that's like very subtle about this movie works so well for me. So Venetia, who is Felix's sister, actually really drives this home for me. And I'm so glad they chose to put her as a character in this movie because I think she just makes it feel like within that era because I, 
am familiar with women's fashion and women's trends of the time that if she weren't in it, I don't know that I would have gotten it as much because we have the bleached blonde hair that's like damaged and I love that the actress, you know, was very committed to the role that she said, bleach my hair, kill it, like make it dead, I don't care. They offered to give her a wig and she was like, no, I'm gonna bleach it. So love the commitment from Alison Oliver. I believe this is her first movie that she's been in as well. So I feel like this is just really gonna propel her career because she was fantastic in this. But between that and her fashion choices in this movie, it was perfect. She was so believable as a wealthy socialite from this era. The complexity of Farley. I feel like I don't see too many people talk about Farley as a character. I I have seen some now um, that it's been out for a while and people are like, you're forgetting about Farley. <laughs> so he was played by Archie Mattaquay and I think he did amazing. Now he's actually British playing an American. So Farley is American in the movie. Anyway, but Farley was perfectly cast. I loved his character. Again, the subtleties of his delivery and his performance that really read as like bullying Oliver a little bit. It just worked so well, like right from the beginning. I feel like even the side characters in this movie are written really well like Oliver's tutor and his dynamic um, and then also Oliver's first friend Michael when he goes to Oxford I loved that character even though he's so minor like yeah he's annoying but it was just so believable like you could tell he was just like this nerdy guy um, and it was just so well written like even the effort put into all the little characters on the side Duncan all of them you know they all have like depth and complexity to them now the first 20 to 30 minutes of this movie really feel like a normal movie almost like a coming-of-age type of movie where Oliver is trying to find his place at Oxford and try to make friends and then you know he sees Felix and he's kind of obsessed with Felix and it just feels very normal and then we actually get to Saltburn and that is where things just start going down obviously so I was really hooked right from the beginning of the movie like it was very intriguing from the beginning and I think it's because of the hype of the movie and I knew some of the scenes like I knew the bathtub scene I knew that was coming so I was like how do we get there from here so that's what I was thinking about the whole like first 30 minutes before we even go to Saltburn I'm like when does that happen why does that happen which some might be bored with because the beginning maybe will feel a little bit like a slog if you're expecting it to jump right off, you know, and start being weird right off the bat. But I don't feel like it needs to. I loved the beginning of this movie. I really like the juxtaposition to where we end up in the end. Now, as shocking as this movie is, you know, especially with those three scenes, I also feel like it's very reserved at the same time, which might sound contradictory, but I feel like Emerald really knew how to give impact with those scenes by being reserved everywhere else and nothing was gratu gratuitous like there wasn't any female nudity which I really appreciated. I think even in those shocking scenes we learn so much about the characters and they're very revealing for the story and they're so essential. Like I feel like this easily could have had graphic sex scenes where both the characters are nude or at least you know some female nudity or like graphic deaths or something like it could easily have gone over the top so quickly given the content of the movie. And it doesn't need that. Like it didn't need anything else to be shocking. I think the shocking scenes that are in there are so imperative to the movie and they added so much that I didn't see them as like gross or disgusting. I was like, that's so interesting that that would happen. Like I was psychoanalyzing the characters involved, you know, I was like, that makes so much sense. So I haven't even mentioned yet how visually stunning this movie is. Like, so beautiful. A lot of the framing is gorgeous. There's a scene at the table where Oliver is in the reflection of the table and it's just so extravagant because, you know, Felix's family do these extravagant parties that are stunning. Like, oh my gosh, Saltburn in general is just beautiful, like the location. And then you have all of the framing and the lighting and the colors. The colors are so important to the story as well, which is great to look at when you're watching it for the second or the third time. Now, of course, there's references to Shakespeare, like Shakespeare's very heavily kind of involved in this. There's a literal reference 
reference to Midsummer Night's Dream. Again, some people say the movie is very derivative of a lot of things, including Shakespeare's. So that's, you know, for you, you to form your own opinion about. I thought it was a perfect amount. I thought it was clearly inspired by other things, but came together in such an original way. And I think that's really key. Like it's one thing to be inspired by other things, but then if you execute it in a very original way with extremely original characters, then you're gonna have a good time. An example of a bad <laughs> uh, case of this that I'm gonna talk about later is actually a book I recently read, Clown in a Cornfield. Um, I have been recommended that book for so long, and sorry, this is a side tangent. If you don't care about books, so you can skip forward. And I read it and wasn't really impressed by it because I felt like it was so derivative and nothing was really original about it. Even the clown thing, it's like it's been done before. So for me, that's like an example of a bad way to be derivative or inspired by something but then not execute it in an original way because I didn't feel like there was anything really original about that book. So what I think is a funny critique about this movie is some people call it pretentious and it could easily again go that direction no problem like I could see how a different writer and director could make this pretentious and over the top especially with the setting and the characters and just like the way the story pans out easily I think it's funny because Emerald Fennel specifically chose 2006 as the time period like there's eyebrow piercings have you heard the soundtrack I'm sorry but what about the soundtrack is pretentious exactly like murder on the dance floor plays at the end like especially in that scene. Is that scene pretentious to you? Because it's a silly, goofy little moment, so. So there's also an argument as to what is the intent of the movie? What is the intention behind Emerald Fennel making this movie to begin with? Because she herself is a wealthy person who I believe went to Oxford as well and is from the UK. So obviously she's not being self-critical necessarily. Some think that this movie is critiquing the wealth, but I see it as a story of obsession. It has nothing to do, I think, with look how bad these wealthy people are because I really don't see them as all that bad. Like, they're not evil people. In fact, I think Felix is such a kind character and he really cares about Oliver. So for me, I see it more as Oliver's obsession with the family and like integrating himself in with this family and Felix's life, basically. So one of my first initial thoughts when I watched this movie was, and it's gonna make some people mad, but you know what? It's okay, I make people mad on a daily basis here on this channel. I don't know if a man could have written this movie as well as Emerald did. I feel like only a woman could understand this, these characters and this story, and obviously is written and directed by Emerald Fennell. I just feel like a man would fumble this story so badly. I feel like a man would put in tons of graphic sex scenes or, you know, female nudity and things like that. And I feel like <laughs> this is really gonna make people mad. It would have taken itself too seriously. I feel like Emerald got the vision of the 2006 era being a silly goofy time. Like I feel like she just gets it that it was, you know, a weird time with the fun music and she gets it. And I feel like because the setting is this old house in the UK, like it's just, it's stunning. Without the fashion choices and the era that it took place in, this movie just would not work the same way for me. Like if this was a very serious toned movie, wouldn't work. And I feel like a man would take it too seriously and try to do that. <laughs> like, I'm just saying, a killing of a sacred deer, that's pretentious, right? And yes, Emerald Fennel still put shocking scenes into the movie, but I do feel like a man would just make it even more shocking in certain ways, you know what I mean? And I think it's perfectly balanced. Like, the shocking scenes, I feel like didn't bother me as much because it's perfectly balanced with, like, the lightness and the fun aspect within this movie. Like, the party scenes, the tennis court, like, there's just, it just looks like a good time, you know generally. <laughs> and I think that's what makes it bearable and not feel over the top, even though the scenes themselves are very uncomfortable to watch. It just doesn't feel like it's too disturbing for me or like too much for me because of the lightness and the fun aspect of the era it's set in and all the little choices and all the little subtleties of that. Obviously don't watch it with your parents or children, that, I think that goes without saying. So let's get into spoilers finally, and I'll go even a deeper dive into this movie and why I love it, and also my criticism of the ending of the movie that, you know, was like the last 20 minutes or so. So let's get into it. So let's actually talk 
about these shocking scenes. I'm going to describe them as best as possible while still staying monetized. First, the bathtub scene. This is the first time we really get to see the level of Oliver's obsession with Felix. They share a bathroom, so their bedrooms are, you know, on either side, and then they have a bathroom in the middle. And Felix is enjoying a nice bath by himself and enjoying a lot, you know, very much so enjoying this bath, you know what I mean? Felix leaves the bathroom to go to bed. Oliver stays in the bathroom, gets in the tub, and drinks some of the bath water. Well, it's like still, it's like barely drained, you know, but he just like it slurps up a little bit what's down there on the on the drain still. The next scene I think is the most important scene for the viewer to understand who Oliver actually is. And it's the first sneak peek we get into his actual character, and that is the vampire scene. So Venetia is outside his window in a see-through nightgown, and he goes out there, and they start, you know, to get into it a little bit. He, she, it's that time of the month, you know, and he's like, I don't care about that, and says that he's a vampire. You know what, do you see where I'm getting at? So things happen uh, later. We don't actually, I feel like we don't see much. Again, these scenes could be so much more graphic. What we do actually see is a little bit of blood around the mouth, right? And we see like a zoomed out shot of the act itself happening through Farley's eyes, through Farley's perspective, looking down and seeing Oliver and Venetia doing this. To me, that scene was so important, not because of what actually happens with like the vampire thing, it's what he says prior. So he learned some very valuable information in the scene right before this with Elspeth, and she basically gives all of Venetia's dirty little secrets away, saying that she's a masochist and she has an eating disorder. And so he uses this. And in the next scene, he tells her, you're going to eat, you're going to take care of yourself now. And it's that manipulation. Like he's using that information that he learned from Elspeth, from her mother, as a manipulation of her. So to me, that was the most important scene because that was the first time in the movie that I was like, Oliver would not act like that. Who is that? Because that's not the Oliver that we saw at Oxford, right? Finally, the last disturbing scene is the grave scene. So Felix dies at Oliver's birthday party. We found out later in the movie that Oliver actually poisoned him. He kind of facilitates all of their deaths in the end um, through this montage, but... The grave scene, so after Felix is buried, um, Oliver is crying, sobbing on top of the grave. It's this very long, drawn out scene. And then he decides, you know, I'm gonna pull my pants down. He desecrates the grave, okay? That scene I think was the most shocking scene. That was the one that I was like, okay, that's disturbing, you right? But again, it's just like the bathtub scene into sh showing the level of obsession. And it's like he, poisoned Felix so he didn't necessarily want to be with him although I think there was a layer of that that he did want to be with him in some way um just the way that he looked at Felix and like admired him but also I think he wanted to be him like I think he actually wanted to just take Felix's role in the family if that was possible now I've seen some jokes on TikTok that those are not the most cringeworthy scenes in the movie that the most cringy scenes that are difficult to watch are actually the birthday party scene where they're all singing happy birthday and they forget Oliver's name. Awkward, anxiety, awkward. Um, also when Felix drives to Oliver's parents that he's been lying about saying that they're drug addicts and that his dad died and they get there and they're just completely normal people and his dad's alive and he's actually not an only child. That scene was torturous. Even the egg scene, the egg scene was really important too because if you're paying attention, again, it's that social awkwardness, um, the secondhand embarrassment that you get through a lot of these scenes. Um, you're cringing a lot throughout the whole movie, regardless if it's social awkwardness or secondhand embarrassment or you're watching depravity. Like it's just gross, you know? But the egg scene, so Oliver orders uh, fried eggs over easy, which is runny that's what over easy means and then when he's delivered the eggs he complains about them being runny so i've seen some people interpret this as like a manipulation of duncan like he's trying to like it's a power move towards duncan who's the caretaker of the grounds who was suspicious of oliver from the beginning and i really have an issue with duncan's character as a whole because how in the world is he around all of this death everyone's dying who 
lives at Saltburn. How is he just fine with that? And then Oliver taking over the estate in the end, like inheriting it basically from Elspeth. How is, I mean, Duncan's still there. They make a point to say that he's still there and everything's the same. So how is he not more suspicious about all of this? Like, and he was suspicious of Oliver to begin with. Do they have some kind of agreement? Has he manipulated Duncan to this point where he just doesn't say anything? I'm not really sure. I wish that was thoroughly explained or like, you know, fleshed out a little bit more. Now, the scene that affected me the most, like the one where I was physically like uncomfortable and it was jarring was actually, it was almost like a jump scare. When he got on top of Elspeth, who was on a ventilator and he rips that ventilator tube right out of her throat. Like it was nothing. Oh my God. And then she suffocates. That was the hardest part to watch for me. Um, I'm gonna be a little uh, dark here for just a second, but how she was in that hospital bed was the last time that I saw my dad was, okay? So that's why for me, it was like the most difficult to watch because the last time I saw my dad, he was literally like that with a ventilator. So it was jarring. It was, I couldn't separate the two. Like I had just, I mean, it was, it happened last year. So like I, I just couldn't separate it. Um, and I think that's why it affected me. But I've seen a lot of people say that scene was, you know, rough to watch regardless. I mean, you're watching a ventilator being ripped out of someone like. Now watching it a second time, you get to see how all of their deaths are almost foreshadowed and they're not all very literal or obvious. So obviously we have that scene at the breakfast table where Venetia's telling this story about a doppelganger and he later drowned. Well, you see as she says that, Felix actually walk in the background outside of the house and he's in the room. So there's two of him. So it's just foreshadowing later that he's going to die. There's a scene after Felix has died where Venetia's pouring herself a glass of wine and doesn't stop and it's like overflowing and it's red wine, kind of like the tub water is after she kills herself in the bathtub later. So that's kind of can be seen as foreshadowing. Even Elspeth like chokes on some food at some point. So it's like minor things, but maybe could be hinted at their deaths. One thing that I wish we got to see more of or more explanation, and maybe I have to watch it through a third time to really get more information, or maybe it's like explained more, is the death of the dad. He dies off camera, right? It's just Oliver reading a newspaper and sees the obituaries that he died and I wish we got more of that and like to find out exactly how he died or what happened there. Another one I wish, Pamela. I wish we got to know what happened to Pamela. We get a little bit but again maybe I'm missing like really minute details and I don't think Oliver had anything to do with either of those two deaths because that would just seem a little bit out of his reach but maybe he did because I don't see him giving up after the end of his birthday party where Felix has died and he stays around for a little while, but eventually, he, you know, he leaves and the dad dies and Elspeth is still there or she like got an apartment, you know, cause it was too hard to be there. But then she was also really willing to move back there with Oliver. And that was a very strange jump for me because she, if she said it like felt too big and obviously both her children died there, her husband probably died there. I understand why she'd want to get out. So then how does she all of a sudden just want to move back with Oliver? She's like, you should come visit. And it's like, I would think she would want to be far away from that place forever. So there's a couple things that I wish were a little bit more explained or like we got a little bit more information as to how she came to that decision or what their deaths were like. We don't need to see all their deaths, I suppose. But I was interested in Pamela's death and the dad's death and like what happened with them. Now, nothing in this movie is over explained up until the end where we get a full montage. We don't need the montage. A montage, honestly, in this day and age, can just come across as like lazy writing a little bit because you're just showing us and here's how he did it. And it's like, we don't, we don't need to go all the way back. We don't need to go all the way back to Oxford where he put a pin in Felix's bike wheel. We don't need to go that far because we would have come to that conclusion 
the second time we watch it. You know, it'd just be fun to like come up with theories on our own. We got the bar scene where he couldn't pay for the drinks. We can assume that he actually did have the money because if you look at his family, it's a pretty nice house. Like you have to assume that they're actually kind of wealthy or at least, you know, upper middle class where he could actually afford those drinks. We would have made that connection on our own. I wish those scenes weren't over explained and like shown to us um, and spoon fed to the viewer because we don't need that. So I just feel like the last 20 minutes is a little bit rushed. It's a little bit impossible. Like a lot of the decisions from everyone, like it had to have been a perfect storm. And I know he's a psychotic genius, but, and like very manipulative, but it had to have been the perfect storm for him to end up with the estate of Saltburn. Like in no world would that actually happen in that perfect order. Like it ended up being perfect for him. And the way it had to go down was so complex. Not saying that we're above that because it's fiction, but everything. Like he had to count on Elspeth wanting a romantic relationship with him. How could he ensure that? And I under again, he's a psychopath. He's like, manip he's, I don't know, charming, like a serial killer. But then you have to have him manipulate Duncan enough to where he just sits on the side and does absolutely nothing and just lets Elspeth sign over Saltburn to Oliver so he can inherit it. Like how is Duncan just not a participant in this at all in the end when these people keep dying? Like Oliver's the only change here. So a lot of the what happens in the end feels impossible and if anything is explainable or I'm missing something because I only watched it twice, you know? I do plan on watching this more and more because I do feel like there's so much more to discover as we go on. Um, but if anything is explainable, please let me know. I am, I will take a slice of humble pie and admit when I'm wrong if something is explainable as far as like how Duncan is the way he is, the relation, all of that. Like if you have theories or evidence from the movie, please leave it down below. I could probably continue to go on and on about this movie. I've been filming for so long, but I'm gonna end it here. So I would love to know your thoughts on Saltburn. Was it shocking? What was your favorite scene? What was the most shocking scene to you? Leave it all down below. Let's have a discussion about Saltburn. I hope you enjoyed and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.